Hello, everyone. Since October 2017, when Har the Harvey Weinstein scandal grabbed international headlines and survivors from all backgrounds and walks of life began speaking out about their experiences of sexual harassment and sexual assault, there has been a much needed injection of energy and renewed persistence in eradicating sexual violence from our communities. More importantly, the movement and its sister movements that followed, like Time's Up and the We Too movement in Japan and the Me Too movement in India, uh, called out structures and systems that have enabled perpetrators to go unpunished. In the months and years that followed, we've seen positive steps made by institutions, governing bodies, and the media that we are all in a position to impact widespread change. Hong Kong has had sexual violence problem we don't often discuss here. One of seven women will experience sexual violence in her lifetime in the city, yet nine of 10 don't report it. Why is this? How do we move past the inertia and apathy to make real change starting today? I have four experts with me to discuss some issues surrounding this. We have Ricky Chu, who is the chairperson for the Equal Opportunities Commission. Pooja Kapai, who's an associate professor of law at the University of Hong Kong. Anita Lam, who's the head of employment for the Hong Kong office of Clifford Chance. And Linda Wong, executive director for the Association Concerning Sexual Violence Against Women. Uh, we're going to try to make this a conversation so I'll get started right away, and I'm going to uh, direct this to, to Pooja. Uh, although headlines haven't spotlighted sexual assault and sexual harassment until just a couple years ago, women's rights groups and other supporters in the region have been working on this issue for decades. Tell us how far has Asia come, what are some good spots, and what more work needs to be done. Thank you, Jody. I think that you know the Harvey Weinstein scandal seems to uh, be so pr prominent on people's mind that they, they almost think that that's where the movement against sexual harassment has begun. But as we know, the hashtag MeToo itself uh, was the work of Tarana Burke. Uh, and also in the region in Asia itself, there have been movements against sexual harassment and violence against women way before the MeToo movement. So for example, in India, after the Delhi student gang rape, in 2012 December. Um, in China, we've had the Feminist Five, um, and there have been lots of movements against Dalit women, um, uh, movements relating to migrant workers in the region. So the work regarding gender-based violence and sexual harassment has been ongoing well before these headlines made uh, sort of our uh, social media uh, sort of uh, feeds. Um, that said, however, the question is in Asia, what does it take to gain traction? Right. And one of the things that the Me Too movement has done is help to um, sort of galvanize in a sort of sense of achieving a public uh, form of justice um, by enabling a conversation that's been very difficult to have in Asia. And so the highlights for me really have been um, watching women come together in solidarity despite censorship in China. So the um, adoption of the rice bunny um, phrase uh, as, a, as a way to counter state censorship against the use of Me Too hashtag. Uh, in Korea, we saw allegations against a, uh, as a, uh, against a political candidate Right, and he was brought down and eventually stepped down from his candidacy uh, on charges of rape. Uh, we saw the falling of a prominent senior male journalist in Japan. Um, and the beauty of it is in a culture where it's so difficult to talk about these things, these women have managed to amass um, a lot of women who are willing to share their stories. And they've coined their own hashtags called stand with you, uh, or you know, it doesn't help to be silenced, or silence will not help you. So I think that there's a great deal to learn. But that said, there remain many challenges. For example, um, we know that in Asia, patriarchy punishes empowered women. This is something we also see in what we refer to as the West. Um, we also still stuck on labels and stereotypes, so we're still looking for the perfect victim or uh, you know, go along with uh, rape myths when we question whether something happened or not. We also seem to be uh, having a hard time reconciling the gentleman rapist uh, contradiction. So you know, he couldn't have done that. I know him well. He's a family man, or he's so religious, right? Um, and then, of course, breaking the shackles of cultural censorship uh, in, in unique ways. And what I think the movement has done is really uh, mobilize a new um, creativity among um, activists on the ground. And I think that that bodes well for what we can hope uh, to gain out of this current momentum that we have. 
Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, ask Linda about, let's turn to Hong Kong, where we're sitting. Uh, what are some specific barriers here to sexual violence victims and sexual harassment victims seeking uh, medical, legal, and emotional support they might need? Actually, Ring Ding Lili is helping victims of sexual violence, including rape, sexual assault, and uh, sexual harassment. I think in terms of the uh, uh, handling sexual assault, sexual assault cases, it is uh, very prolonged. And uh, the government said now they have the one-stop service for victims of sexual violence. But uh, I think it is very insufficient because uh, we find that victims are requested uh, to do many times of uh, statement takings, including they, when they are raped or sexually assaulted, they have to go to a forensic examination and then medical checkup, they have to say it once again, and then they have to attend at least uh, a lot of police interviews, uh, like uh, six, five to six times at least, uh, with the police interviews at different districts when she is raped. And so this is far from uh, ideal, I think. And so Rainily is striking for the one-stop service that is like the other countries to set up uh, rape crisis centers in, in three hospitals in three different districts, like Hong Kong, Kowloon, and New Territories. And now we are asking the government to set it up, but they said that now <laughs> there is, uh, they, they don't have enough, enough resources, rooms, I don't know. <laughs> and in terms of the medical support, I think um, now in Hong Kong, out of 43 hospitals, they have uh, 17, seven, one seven, 17 um, uh, A and E. They said that they have two designated rooms for victims, so they uh, ensure that the victims have their safety and privacy. But uh, in fact, uh, when our counselors are going out, there is many hospitals, AED, do not have rooms. And victims have to take the statement uh, behind the curtain, uh, at the cubicle curtain, which is very unsafe. And in terms of the sexual harassment issue, I think we also, after the Me Too movement, we have a lot of sexual harassment, uh, harassment cases. And I have uh, learned from the EOC that in these two years, they got 268 cases and 80% of them are occurred in workplace. But because the main purpose of EOC is doing the conciliation, we don't have a tribunal. And so when victims are, they, they go through the uh, conciliation process of the EOC, they, they, I think they lack emotional and legal support as well. And so uh, they just go along. And so that's why we also set up some pro bono service from Rain Lily and have counselors and some pro bono lawyers to back up the victims uh, to go through the EOC process. But because we, we are law and government support, and so we are very difficult to find uh, pro bono lawyers. But uh, we are so happy that and in these three years, uh, with some of the funding support, although the funding support will be ended in the end of this year, that we have, we have helped uh, four to five cases uh, under the EOC to, to, win, uh, to win back some compensation. So I think uh, we need to continue our effort to uh, remove the barrier of the victim. Good, thank you. Well, while we're talking about changing social and cultural stigma towards victims and survivors, uh, Hong Kong's a diverse city, obviously. And what populations might have some specific vulnerabilities we should be aware of and, and what can be done to help them more? I'm going to um, give this to Pooja and Ricky. So Pooja, if you want to um, sure. let us know what you think. So just picking up on um, Linda's uh, thread just now, right? So there's a lot of um, cultural barriers in addition to the practical barriers that Linda referred to. So, for example, victims who are named or who come forward, they're often shamed and judged first. There are often questions about what they were wearing, were they drinking, are they sexually active, all of which have very little to do with the incident itself and how their bodies were vi violated. So I think that there's a cultural... Um, there's an ingrained culture in which there continues to be this taboo against talking about sexual harassment and being a victim. But there's also this language about victim, right? Victimhood, you have to present in a particular way. You need to be demure. Or in order to persuade somebody that you really were um, raped or assaulted, you have to have demonstrated that you fought back uh, you know, to preserve your modesty or your dignity. So these stereotypes, I think, often um, hinder victims from coming forward. So we need to consider how ready, you know, so we've got the Me Too movement and people are calling on victims to speak out, speak up, but how prepared is society to support women and men who come forward with their stories?
stories. In Hong Kong, we've seen the backlash that um, Vera Loy, for example, has encountered despite you know, her experiencing um, a similar assault when she was very young. Um, the community was supportive and did galvanize around her, but it wasn't sufficient to enable her to attain justice, um, not in society, but also not through the legal process itself. And I think that brings me to the other challenge, which, which is our laws still remain fundamentally outdated. We don't have statutory rape provisions when you have transgressions against minors. They still have to present themselves as witnesses in courts. The, um, the sort of the environment in which they're required to make statements. I mean, imagine a child going through all the procedures that Linda just outlined. Uh, it's not um, at all conducive to rehabilitation of the victim. Uh, and it doesn't um, lead to the kind of outcome we expect out of um, a legal system. So, you know, those are just some of the barriers. And I think the discourse of masculinity as well. I think if we think about how crimes or these kind of acts are framed, they take a perpetrator-centric or a male-centric um, gaze or approach, and I think that's deeply problematic. There's not enough language in the legal sector or in the sort of social work uh, and NGO sector to talk about these things without feeling ashamed mm -hmm. by what has happened. How do you seek help if you can't use certain words or people are shocked about your knowledge of certain types of sexual activity? So I think there's a range of issues um, that serve as deep rooted barriers which are cultural and systemic. Uh, and until we don't sort of dismantle those, we're not going to be able to sort of make the kind of progress we wish to see. Ricky, what, what is happening on the ground here in Hong Kong? There are some things that, that are uh, being done uh, with sexual harassment victims, correct? Yeah, <coughs> um, from the EOC's experience, actually, um, a large portion or in, the, in, the, in our population, in fact, are vulnerable to this sexual harassment. In the, uh, under our ordinance, sexual harassment would be a civil offense if the two parties, i.e. the harasser and the harassed, uh, has some sort of relationship. Say, for example, employer, employee, uh, teachers and students, um, or workers in the common workplace. So the offenses that the EOC looking at are not all sexual harassment, but rather sexual harassment between two parties having a particular relationship, and the common characteristics seems to be that the victim tend to be in an inferior position in the environment, either in the, in the institute, in the organization, or even in a group. And uh, so we can say that the scope of sexual harassment covered by the ordinance is not too comprehensive. If two citizens having no particular relationship, one sexually harass the other, it may not come under EOC's uh, perspective. So to compensate for this inadequacy, back in 2016, three years ago, we have proposed to the government to enlarge the scope of the sexual harassment offenses uh, within our present legislation. And uh, so far, the government has undertaken to take up um, one recommendation uh, in this aspect. That is to cover sexual harassment in the same workplace. So i.e. any two individuals uh, working under one shelter, like in this room, then we would have some sort of relationship, working relationship, or just the relationship of being in the same room, and if one harass the an another, it becomes an offense. But then, of course, we are dealing with this offense in the civil proceedings. Mm -hmm. So the most we can get are civil compensations uh, for the victim. Uh, it's not a criminal offense. So we have some uh, handicap in dealing with this kind of scenario. And in the future, um, we hope that we can improve in this area as well by further exploring any improvement that we can do uh, to improve our law. And to this end, uh, we would be proposing to set up a dedicated unit to specifically deal with all sorts of scenarios uh, in sexual harassment area.
Thank you. I'd like to move on to uh, the workplace and what workplaces look like in response to the Me Too movement. I'm going to ask Anita, um, what does company best practices look like for handling sexual harassment allegations? And are we moving to best practice? Are more companies uh, taking this seriously and, and trying to, uh, you know, to follow what might be the best way to do this expeditiously? I think um, best practices comes in many forms. So we help a lot of companies deal with investigations of harassment complaints. And I think the best practices are those, for instance, where they have whistleblowing channels, listen up channels. But I think at the core of all matters is actually the culture of the company. So everything that we talked about, like channels to complain, they're just forms. But actually, it's the substance and the heart of the matter is really the, the trust and the culture of the company. So complainants need to be um, able to feel safe to make the complaint. Um, they need to be able to trust the management and also have trustworthy HR senior managers to do the right thing and also make sure that investigations are properly handled, given the various risk at stake. So I think it's um, really encouraging people to speak up because if you comply only to the minimum requirements of the law, that's bound to get, companies are bound to get to, into trouble. Whereas um, if you are doing the right thing, you have the right culture, you encourage people to speak up and not just adhering to the minimum standard. I mean, I think that's the, the best practice we see. Good. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about social media. Obviously, with uh, the, uh, Me Too and some of the other uh, hashtags here that uh, Pooja has mentioned, this has helped empower women and give them a voice uh, in calling out sexual harassment and assault. But on the flip side of that, uh, in the wake of recent events, we've also seen increases, um, kind of alarming increases, actually, in online sexual harassment, predominantly toward women, uh, rape threats, body shaming, doctored photos, doxing, abuse of gendered attacks. Um, and how do, I'd like to talk a little bit um, um, about how government, media, and, uh, and others can tackle this and balance this with uh, freedom of speech. Uh, and what are, again, best practices? Uh, what are some things that, that we could take away from here right away that, and that maybe we can all do as, as citizens? Uh, netizens, I guess we are. Um, and Pucha, would you like to, to think sure. about that with us? So I think one of the most significant aspects of the social media um, dimension in the Me Too movement particularly is that um, it's taken usually three or four victims to come out against a particular perpetrator in order to galvanize sort of the process against them. And so obviously this is a very significant channel, but as you've said, it brings with it this risk of backlash. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's so overwhelming and so significant because of the ways in which um, accounts have been uh, proliferating to, to deliberately target particular individuals. Um, and the challenge is that the social media platforms themselves have not yet um, been, have not been able to keep up with the policing of their platforms where they allow these materials to stay online. Um, and the channels that we have to file complaints, for example, on grounds of vilification or sexual harassment online, uh, they don't work as effectively because there is um, privacy-related laws which the social media companies can hide behind. And often they're not headquartered here in Hong Kong, they're headquartered somewhere else, so we can't compel them. We don't have the powers to compel compel them to deliver uh, the identities of the respondents. So again, it's very difficult to enforce. So I think you know there's a very strong role then for netizens to ask how can we um, support sort of these women. And that involves thinking very critically about whether you share a post or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know what advice can we give to women who have become targets online? And it's also important to recognize that it's not just gender that becomes this target of um, um, harassment. There are multiple facets of people's identities that are then starting to, uh, you know, coagulate to to make them feel completely diminished. So, for example, um, their gender identity um, or their race, religious. 
uh, background, any aspect in which they can be sort of named and um, targeted for harassment and hate, all of those things will be brought up um, online. So I think that we as a community that um, is engaged in social media need to improve media literacy, but also um, you know, develop protocols for how you engage in activism online and how you protect yourself. And there are some good guides online, which I'd like to see shared more widely as best practices in Hong Kong. And I don't think we've come around to that. But that would be the way to um, sort of salvage the upsides of uh, social media in raising awareness, but also not falling prey to the kind of attacks that we've seen. Yeah, Ricky, yeah. would you want to address that? It's right in pointing out the difficulties for us to tackle uh, online sexual harassment uh, scenarios. Um, for example, if someone uh, put up a even something like a hate speech or sexually harass another person by putting a post in, uh, say, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, etc. And if we are to deal with this kind of complaint, the first step we need to do is to identify the perpetrator, isn't it? But whenever we approach the social media platform asking for the identity, uh, which can, or evidence leading to us identifying this perpetrator, it always fails technically, because the, the data, in theory, is not stored within the Hong Kong territory. So we need to go to the, uh, to the origin of the social, well, uh, social media platform, asking for the information. To do this by way of uh, a legal process in Hong Kong is quite convoluted. We need to go through the high court asking for the uh, letter request uh, going through to the uh, to the courts in the in the other say in the United States. So all these uh, mechanism can norm are normally applicable only in serious crimes and not for civil offenses like uh, sexual harassment as it stands now. So unless we are upgrade the offense uh, to become a criminal offense, otherwise. Uh, this route is really a no-go in terms of investigation. But I don't think we lose all because even though we cannot pursue the identity of the perpetrator on this official line, I think for unofficial line, we can still do something. For this, we would have to rely on informants. Say, if we can get some people saying that, oh, I know this author in, in, in Facebook, uh, he's the one who used to write all these things. I know he, he resides in somewhere. He, he was some, uh, some reporter or some uh, journalist in, in an address. So if we can have some live witness telling us who these perpetrators are, there are chances that we may still be able to identify them. But then, once again, even if we identify such perpetrators, all we can do from the EOC point of view, we can only ask him or her to try to conciliate. So it's still uh, not really satisfactory, but this is the present situation. Well, and not only have we seen uh, a backlash online, we've also seen it in some companies where male employees um, are afraid to mentor women, uh, travel with female employees, reluctant to hire women. I think those are convenient excuses. But um, what should organizations be doing to sort of manage this male anxiety? And, and what can women do? I mean, you know, as women, we already get asked to mentor other women all the time. We're being, I know many of you like me are being asked to do that more. Should we be doing that more and, and let some of these guys off the hook who say they don't want to do this? Or, you know, what, what do we do? I'd, I'd like to actually hear from all of you on this. And, and Ricky, as the man on the panel. Yeah, maybe I have a go first because you're first. Um, not too <laughs> <laughs> Not because of I have any anxiety, <laughs> but because really. <laughs> Not too long ago, not too long ago, on one occasion, uh, I met some representatives uh, who are all males from an from a NGO, a certain organization. Um, when we met, the first thing the gentleman told me was asking me for help. He asked me what EOC can do if a male employee are, is accused of having sexually harassed uh, a colleague. 
And that what if the allegation is fictitious, is a malicious allegation? Does he have any means of redress? Because uh, what they are saying is that even if the in, uh, investigation at the end proved that the allegation is a malicious one, uh, cannot be substantiated, but his reputation would have already been ruined. On many occasions, the, um, the male employee, the perceived the perpetrator, would be asked to resign or to, uh, for the sake of reaching a peaceful consensus, maybe just say some words to the effect of apologizing to the other party. No matter whether you do it right or you do it wrong, it doesn't matter anymore, just apologize. <laughs> so that's their worry. They ask me what, what the EOC can do to help them. And of course, I have to be frank with them. I said, sorry, there is nothing. <laughs> There's practically nothing that EOC can help you if you want to redress. Because in our law, we don't penalize people making malicious allegations, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But I did offer some advice to them. I said, if you want to root out this so-called male anxiety issue, the ultimate solution lies in cooperating with the company to draw up guidelines, be transparent to everybody so that all the employees in the company can have a fixed set of guidelines to follow. And we have to change and our traditional mindset of the male superiority. We need to be respectful to all of our colleagues, not only to the opposite sex, but to fellow colleagues. They may be disabled, uh, maybe have a different uh, sexual orientation, uh, maybe an ethnic minority. It's the way we treat the minority groups, the way we treat other fellows with respect. I think if we can achieve this, then we would root out the problem. We don't need to be anxious anymore. Anita, and companies, how do you encourage champions of, of both genders? Um, we at Clifford Charles actually got male allies, so, and it is actually something that we are very proud of. And I think um, going back to the question as to how uh, men should deal with the anxiety piece, my uh, advice is that uh, education and training is key. Um, and also, it's really understanding the risk entail that would entail because of these complaints, because you have the people risk, you have people complaints, and therefore they leave, they resign. Um, also, you have your reputation to, to consider, the brand of the individual as well as the firm. And also, you, you need to think about the regulatory piece as well, so the regulatory risk. If you work in a financial institution, if you're subject to investigation, then that is something that could be reported to the regulators, such as the um, Securities and Futures Finan uh, Commission. So it's, it's all these things, and in addition to people risks like um, litigation risks, that you need to think about. But at the heart of the matter, again, is the culture and also respect, as Ricky has just said. So it's very difficult to um, have a one-size-fits-all solution, but I think respect actually comes a long way. Um, mindful of the cultural differences that we have in the society that we work in, and so uh, I think respect and education is the key. Yes. Uh, actually, I think anxiety is good. Every one of us has anxiety, and anxiety and and sure change, right? <laughs> and so I, 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 after the Me Too, we start the church too as well, and then I got a lot of <laughs> inquiries from churches and also organizations, and one of the questions they're asking is, uh, how could we do for men if there's a wrong allegations? But I have to assure you that although I, 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 we are not working with uh, men, but uh, most of our victims, when they come out, most of very few of them have false allegations. And um, I need to point out that um, before Me Too, that people just uh, think about sexual harassment, that they have a myth that it is a less serious issue than other types of sexual violence. And so because at that time, most of the um, most of the uh, um, uh, the, the uh, agencies, organizations, and uh, they, they, they are not aware that 
uh, they are some of the employers have to liable to the acts of the sexual harassment committed by the employees. But afterwards, they know that now they may be liable, and so they need to do something to discharge these liabilities, then they have to set up anti-sexual harassment policies. And so afterwards, many companies and trusts, they call us, they ask us how can they set up this policy, and one of their anxieties is how how do they prevent this um, false allocation <laughs> happens on some male employees? But I have to tell you that actually, uh, every one of us need to learn how to uh, do a sexual consent. Right? We, li we, li we, we never knew what is consent in our education. They never uh, uh, teach us what is the consent. And so we need to learn that. And um, one of the uh, Important things is um, we also uh, need uh, to let the people know that sexual harassment is not only out of bad intent. Because some of our cases, they are out of good intent. I want to be with you, so that's why I, I want to touch you. But you know, after a case has happened uh, in a church, it changed. Then uh, that perpetrator, she feel, he feel very... Um, Bad. He thinks that he's not doing out of good intent. He is doing that out of good intent, and how come that actually he need to punish? But we have to know that uh, if you you touch somebody, even you are with good intent, uh, that make people sexually offensive and humiliating and intimidating. That's sexual harassment, and the employers has the responsibility to build up a sexual. Uh, Friendly. I mean, the less hostile environment uh, for our uh, for our employees, and so I think it is good to have anxiety. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Every one of us has anxiety in Hong Kong, right? <laughs> <laughs> who who hasn't has anxiety? But we need to change, right? <laughs> we need to change. It's the time for us to change, just like what uh, <laughs> Mr. Chu said. Good. Pucha, what what can we do in our workplaces? What can women do? Um, you know, to encourage male allies to sort of say, without belittling it, to say, look at, you know, we all need to step up. Um, we are not a asking you to put yourself in unusual situations, and most people don't um, allege things, you know, improperly. How, how do you have that conversation? Well, I think the first most important thing is to recognize that a systemic problem requires a systemic response and solution. Mm -hmm. Right? And if we really dig deep, at the heart of um, the problem of sexual harassment is this huge power imbalance. Mm -hmm. And so men uh, you know, in organizations do not recognize that they hold positions of power and privilege, which allow them to behave in particular ways um, to other people's detriment, and they are allowed to get away with it. So I think um, it's very important to have a measure of transparency to help people recognize that they are complicit. We are all complicit in a system where we enable perpetrators to get away, for the most part, with what they have done. And so I think once we um, sort of open people's eyes to that reality, that it's not you know women who are exaggerating claims or things that didn't really happen or they're taking things too seriously, I think they, they can bring the due respect to the table and then sincerely consider what is their own role and responsibility in uh, effecting change, right? So in terms of the systemic change part, how do we, I mean, it goes back to the heart of what is at issue at the summit. How do we um, effect gender equality? How do we give back the power and restore the balance so that one doesn't have the one-upmanship over you when you're in a position of, um, you know, vulnerability at an organization. And I think that comes down to um, several things. One, as everyone has said, you have to have a specific and clear policy that makes uh, no bones about what is or is not acceptable at the organization. Second, it has to be enforced. There have to be no let offs. Um, the enforcement should be in some measure public so people can recognize that these are the consequences that will follow and there's no easy pass even if it's not intended, right? And then the third thing I think is to recognize the importance of a diverse leadership so that we can um, understand the different values that people of diverse backgrounds bring with them. And when they experience um, sexual harassment, they may not necessarily work through their trauma in the same 
you know, um, mirrored or modeled manner that the system expects from them. Um, so having diverse leadership, which doesn't just mean having women at the top or women in the complaints mechanism process. Sometimes women can be enablers as well of allowing the problem to fester. It means having feminist leaders um, in the process who can step up and require people to acknowledge the wrongs done and then attempt sort of solutions. So I think the idea is to build an ecosystem in the company, as you've said, Anita, a cultural sort of change to push shame back to where it belongs, which is it's the responsibility of the person rather than the victim, the perpetrator, and then to enable every um, frontline person or a bystander to call out when they see something happening. And I think there, we shouldn't necessarily just rely on effective response mechanisms. I think companies' roles should primarily be to prevent these kinds of things from happening in the first place. And when we get to that position where we create a culture which, in which women feel free to be in a room you know, with, where there may be a dominance of men and not to have to worry about being attacked or feeling uncomfortable uh, or how to talk about it, then I feel we've moved closer to our goal. Well, um, I hope we've, we've reduced somebody's, everybody's anxiety a little bit. And uh, join me in thanking our panelists.